Okay, today I'm talking with Jemin Desai, who is a graduate of UC Berkeley with degrees in electrical engineering and nuclear engineering. He has recently worked at Environmental Progress, a pro-nuclear energy organization based in Berkeley and founded by Michael Schellenberger. Um, recently, I attended an event hosted by Environmental Progress called Stand Up for Nuclear, where I met Jemin and had a great time talking with the nuclear folks. Um, one, because I agree that nuclear energy is uh, most likely the most rational way forward in terms of energy. But also, I think that uh, a lot of the nuclear energy people who I spoke with, they tend to just have the mindset of abundance rather than scarcity when it comes to the, the future of, of energy use. And I think that that just is the, the natural way to go forward. Um, I want to get into that a little bit with you, Jemin, but uh, I kind of want to start just um, talking about the current state of nuclear and where we're at right now in the US. And I'm also kind of curious your thoughts on what country is doing nuclear the best and uh, just just if the US will ever be there. Okay, uh, do you want me to talk about from a world perspective what the current state is or uh, just the US? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm curious about California um, because I know that they're they were a leader in nuclear energy, and now they're just about to shut down Diablo Canyon, their last remaining nuclear power plant. I'm curious about the U.S. because we still get some substantial amount of energy from nuclear, but I know that we're way behind France, and I'm just kind of curious, like globally too, because I know that. Um, you know, Michael Schellenberger talks a lot about how the way forward for a lot of developing nations is to jump on board nuclear sooner rather than later. Um, and I just, I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on, on kind of the, the, the whole, the whole picture for like the current status of nuclear. Sure thing. So there are 442 reactors in the world as of the end of last year. Um, there were six reactors that started. One was in South Korea. Three were in Russia. Two were in China. Uh, of the three in Russia, two of them were actually floating reactors. So they built reactors off the northeast coast of Russia. This thing provides a little bit of electricity. It's a small, they're small reactors, a little bit of electricity to the town of Pevik and provides district heating as well. So it's really a one of a kind. Um, but the other four startups were all large pressurized water reactors, PWRs. And uh, what a PWR is, is just a generic way to really describe most of the reactors that are operating right now. So for example, my laptop right now is a MacBook Air. A MacBook Air is a type of MacBook. And so likewise, there are a bunch of different kinds of reactors in the world, but you would characterize most of them as PWR. Um, and that's still sort of the gold standard in the world, the thing that everybody's still pursuing. Whenever a new reactor is under construction, it's pretty much going to be a PWR. Um, there were 13 reactor shutdowns, though, uh, but a lot of them were reactors that were already not producing electricity for some time, and so they were formal shutdowns. Uh, for example, all four that shut down in Japan were already not producing electricity since Fukushima. Hmm. So those are formally shut down. There was hope that uh, they have restarted a lot of reactors in Japan, but the four that they shut down, they decided they won't. Uh, the other nine sh shutdowns were three in each of South Korea, Germany, and Taiwan. And these were all for political reasons. There wasn't any technical issues with the plants. Uh, these countries are just, they have anti-nuclear energy policy right now. But in spite of having more startups or more shutdowns and startups, last year was actually the second highest amount of nuclear energy generation ever. Uh, the only higher year was 2006. And that was only higher by three terawatt hours. The last year was 2,657 terawatt hours. 2006, it was 2,660. So a very small difference. So it's almost an all-time high last year, part because reactors tend to operate better with age. They don't, they don't age poorly. They age like wine. They don't age like humans. Uh, we, uh, we're finding now with more and more experience running these things that the older they get, uh, the better we get at uh, producing large amounts of power with them, we're able to improve what's called their capacity factor, which means, uh, which usually just means extending the amount of time that they stay online um, 
and things like that. So if I can if I can stop you really quick, you you refer to uh, we like we are in and you're a nuclear engineer. So when you say we, like you literally mean you, your your peers in the nuclear energy field. Um, so well, let me stop you right there. Yeah, I may I may mean my peers, but I don't mean me. I'm not working in uh, any uh, nuclear plant or any nuclear construction or anything like that. I'm working strictly in a transmission and distribution company. So that electricity right. can come from renewables or nuclear or fossil fuels. That's all the same. Okay, right. So well, I, I, would, I would not claim that I'm doing any work on these things right now. Well, well then I, I say I we, I you know, human we, right, okay. <laughs> we the people. Well, I do love that you have a technical background in this because uh, most people that I hear commenting on nuclear energy, myself very much included, uh, we have zero technical background. And so when when I hear about a nuclear power plant being shut down and I hear this list of technical reasons or political reasons why they're being shut down, um, I have no way of like having an insight into in, into how political it is versus how technical it is. Um, for all of the nuclear power plants that you listed that have been shut down, um, have they most been for political reasons or are they technical reasons? And kind of on top of that, if they were for technical reasons, are they like issues that can't be overcome or is it just like a money thing that they weren't able to maintain them properly? Well, so, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can, it's easy to get confused and not really confused, but sort of go down a rabbit hole as far as like, oh, how political is it versus technical versus financial. At the end of the day, if human beings want to use nuclear, they'll figure out a way to use nuclear. That's sort of the main, that's the main reason I would say we're able to use a lot of renewables right now is because we just decided that we really like solar and wind. If we decide we don't like solar and wind anymore, we'll stop using them. So the basic premise, I would say, is it's always political. Um, aside from maybe like really early reactor shutdowns, um, where we didn't have a lot of experience with them, some of them had partial meltdowns and a lot of issues, and we were learning. But these days, when the reactor shuts down, it's entirely political. Even Chernobyl, um, Chernobyl had four reactors. Only one of them exploded. It was a steam explosion. That's the accident everybody knows. That was at Unit 4 in 1986. But the other three units, the other three reactors, continued operating until 2000. And the reason it was shut down is because of a lot of international pressure. For example, Germany didn't want the Ukraine to be able to join the EU until they shut down Chernobyl. And ultimately, the cherry on top was that the Ukraine was able to secure an international loan of some $215 million to be able to two new reactors to replace some of what would be lost after shutting down Chernobyl. So even a reactor like that, even reactors like that um, are able to stay online and shut down for what was essentially political reasons. So I would say that the easiest way to navigate these issues is assume it's political until you give, or you're given a laundry list of, oh, but this was wrong, this was wrong, this needed repair, that needed repair, this was leaking. And then you can maybe go, okay, I guess this is probably a really technical issue. But like I said, what we're finding with reactors is they don't age. We, they don't age in the sense that human beings age. They age in the sense that last year they were a year younger than they are now. But uh, their performance actually tends to improve because of the amount of experience, the learning experience that we have operating these things. So... Um... I mean, one thing that's fascinating about nuclear energy, and I know that you've written about this, is the the movement and the public perception that is just it's just a, a, a terrifying horror movie esque phenomenon. And it's it's so easy for people to latch onto that. Uh, I recently wrote an article about whether California will ever return to being nuclear, and one thing that I stumbled upon. Um, when I was just like, you know, Googling things, furiously trying to put this essay together, was an IMDb page that has, uh, you know, that, that's based around uh, the theme of nuclear reactor meltdowns or, you know, nuclear accidents. IMDb has a whole section on this, and there were like hundreds and hundreds of movies that have some element of like a nuclear. So, I mean, go figure that the, the 
the public perception of this is, is somewhat negative and that it, it makes a, for a great, you know, scary movie. Uh, but I mean, kind of aside from that, uh, it, it's also one of these things that someone can just say, uh, oh, nuclear power, you know, blanket, like problematic reason and then move on without any sense of uh, like, proportionality for how bad that problem really is. Because obviously it's, you know, there are problems with nuclear, there are problems with everything in the world, but it's hard to get a sense of like the proportionality of like, how bad is this really? And in comparison to other forms of energy, um, one example that, that comes to mind, and I want to get your, your, your comments on in general, the movement against nuclear and your thoughts on that. But uh, so, you know, I don't know if you happen to catch, uh, Alex Jones was on was on Joe Rogan, you know, this week, and uh, to to much. I don't of, listen you know, to those people. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, listen well, to Alex Jones. Okay, for entertainment value, you're missing out just a little bit. <laughs> I don't <laughs> either. I don't. I have. I have no. You know, I've, I'm not going to vouch for this guy whatsoever, other than his inter entertainment value is, is up there. But this this was this was fascinating to me in that uh, he touched on nuclear energy for just a second. He's Mr. Conspiracy Theory. So I was like, okay, here we go. What's this conspiracy theory around nuclear, right? Um, he's very positive, very pro-nuclear, except he said this one little thing, which is that 75% of nuclear power plants uh, leak terranium or, or titanium or some, some nuclear, nuclear thing. Yes, that. And so I, so I Googled it casually. I was like, is, is this true? Uh, CBS has an article that pops up on Google that 75% of nuclear power plants leak this thing. It hasn't gone into groundwater, but it's a, it's a problematic thing. Um, and a lot of people will hear that and be like, oh, my talking point for nuclear energy is that 75% of these plants will are leaking some nuclear waste thing um, and, and not be able to at all calibrate how much that is a concern or if this is just like noise statistically that just exists around this thing. Uh, what is your sense of the proportionality? Like how worried should we be? It, or is it just straight fear mongering when someone says 75% of nuclear reactors leak, you know, some nuclear thing? <laughs> so um, let me put it this way. The, you know, this is something that's frequently said about Fukushima too, that they're dumping all this radioactive water into the ocean, it's going to kill our fish. But the amount of uranium that's already in the oceans is millions and millions of times larger. Oh, see, interesting. See, this is, this is exactly that, that point that, that I knew so, I was missing, that context. The <laughs> amount of radiation in our oceans already is just so large that no nuclear power plant could leak enough tritium save their lives in order to make it so that they start to kill fish. In fact, where did, where did that finding, nuclear, where did that come from in the, like, why is the ocean like that? Uh, it's just that uranium is in the earth's crust and oceans are just water on top of the earth's crust. So, oh, um, okay. That, this right. Makes sense. So it's, just, it's like, uh, <laughs> so if, for instance, like, um, you know, you could go deep sea mining for m minerals if you wanted to. It's a lot more expensive because it's harder because it's underwater, but right. And that's just true for any material. So any material you can find on land, you'll find underwater, underground as well, I assume. Um, another thing, though, is that we actually are finding that there are species of, there are wildlife species that depend on nuclear power plants to survive, actually. So I remember reading about Turkey Point apparently supports the a certain local crocodile habitat not exactly cute and fuzzy so maybe that's uh, <laughs> less appealing to people uh there was a there but there are a few power plants like this for different species and in fact even diablo canyon one of the sort of concern trolling issues around the plant is that the heat that diablo canyon emits into the ocean is going to drive the local ecosystem away and that's going to have cascading effect but there's just absolutely no evidence that that's true and that's why that most famous picture of Diablo Canyon is the one with the whale jumping out of the water. Uh, the wildlife is thriving there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And like, there is this story that, um, 
I mean, I I, th I think that it's it's complicated why there's a lot of negative negativity around nuclear, um, and I, I don't want to like focus on this necessarily for this talk. But um, do you buy into the the, the broad broad strokes? Um, I know Michael Schellenberger has talked about uh, the primary reason why a lot of people are like in the green green movement are against nuclear is that it just it solves the problem of environmentalism and allows you to have like an absolute abundance of, of nuclear of, of, of energy. Um, and that's just like a mindset that they don't want. They, they want to always be able to, uh, you know, fight for just, you know, whatever the, the, the pet green um, energy source is at the time. It, that to me seems like a really kind of a cynical view, but it also might be true. Like how, how, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know what, this is actually a common criticism I heard of Michael Moore's documentary, Planet of the Humans, that suddenly now, like Michael Moore is a left-leaning minded guy. Um, and now that renewables are growing so much, suddenly he's against it. So it's like, uh, are these kinds of people really in favor of anything that exists <laughs> ever? <laughs> Um, so it is a very cynical point of view. I'm always a little hesitant to, um, you know, assume any kind of intent because at the end of the day, it's the consequence that matters. So whether environmentalists who are anti-nuclear are well-meaning or not, the consequences of their actions are horrible and we need them to stop. Mm. Right. Uh, what, what do you think... Like I want to transition away from talking about just like the, the downsides of nuclear because there there is endless yeah. debate and it's it's, it's endless fun <laughs> online. The, the pros and cons are fun to look at. Uh, I'm I'm very much on your side, having just like you know read a lot of both sides. I think to me it's it's just I fall very heavily on the side of nuclear. Uh, but kind of if if you were playing God for the world or president for the world, um, what would what would like the future look like for energy and how would nuclear fit into that future? Do you just assume that I like commonly find myself playing God in my head and just know the answer <laughs> to that question? Because <laughs> you're right. Um, <laughs> so here's what I would say. Uh, like it depends on your end goal, right? So if you want nuclear for the sake of nuclear, then you just build nuclear and that's it. And everything else has to find its way. Uh, my end goal is to make sure that we put an end to greenhouse gas emissions because I've always had a keen interest in solving climate change. That's kind of how I got into nuclear in the first place. So that's my end goal. And what there are a couple of things that need to happen. First of all, we need our electricity to be zero carbon or as low carbon as possible. Nuclear can do this because it doesn't uh, emit any carbon. The other thing, though, is that all these clean energy sources, nuclear, solar, wind, hydro, like all of these things almost exclusively produce electricity only. They don't produce heat most of the time, save for specific applications of nuclear, like nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers that the Navy uses. Uh, I believe Russia has built or is building a nuclear icebreaker. Um, so those are niche uses. And then, of course, the district heating that I mentioned that was built last year on the floating power plant. Uh, I believe Finland is building or has already built district heating from nuclear as well. But these are all very um, niche uses of nuclear energy. It's almost always electricity. And that's fine. But I think what that tells us is we need to use more electricity because we have a, th a ton of energy usage that is currently running on fossil fuels. So transportation is the easy one. Everybody is talking about electric cars as opposed to internal combustion engine, right? The gas cars. Um, but other things would be like airplanes, heavy machinery, uh, construction vehicles, like all these things need to start running on either electricity or synthetic fuels that are made from electricity. So bottom line is we need a lot more electricity in the future as well. And uh, the, the technologies that have proven that they encourage what I'll call deep electrification are nuclear and hydro. And when I say deep electrification, I mean like a huge growth in the amount of electricity that the country is using, a huge growth in the infrastructure, things like that. Nuclear and hydro have proven they can do that. And so I would encourage every nation in the world to strongly consider pursuing the, a large build out of dams if it is environmentally responsible to do so. 
and then nuclear where they can't build the dam. So when I was at uh, the event Stand Up for Nuclear, I talked to a lot of folks um, involved with environmental progress, and I noticed a kind of a common theme of, of just, uh, and I know Michael Schellenberger is a little bit, seems seems to you know, project this as well, um, just kind of like a, a negative perspective of wind and solar, just a kind of blanket perspective of wind and solar. Do you think that there is any good use for uh, wind and solar? I mean, I'm kind of thinking the, the case where like someone, you know, I, you know, I, I'm thoroughly convinced that wind and solar can't power, you know, a metropolis. It just doesn't doesn't make any sense, and it would take like thousands and thousands of acres to make that even conceivably possible. And that's just kind of like, you know, antithetical to environmentalism in, in my view. But uh, you know, what about the the person who like goes off the grid and, uh, you know wants to have like you know the uh solar panels on on the roof sort of a thing or uh, that that to me seems like a pretty obvious use for for uh like um uh, wind or solar but what what are your thoughts like are, are you against wind and solar as, as just non-feasible or, or do you think that they have uses they could have some off-grid uses so for example like i i know uh satellites have solar panels on them but that's because they're in space and they can always face the sun um, the, the question you have to ask, Peter, is what do they do that nuclear can't? Because we know the problems they cause. Um, so, for example, Environmental Progress ran a study a few years ago that the amount of money that California and Germany have invested in solar and wind to this day could have been spent on nuclear, and both California and Germany would have gotten off of fossil fuels entirely already. Wow. But instead, right now, California is hovering around 50% natural gas, and Germany is hovering around 30% coal and 10% natural gas. And Germany is still looking to build gas pipelines from Russia and, and is still expanding its coal mines. So you really have to ask yourself, because, the, I mean, that's a huge opportunity cost, right? If, if that's money that could have gone into eliminating fossil fuels immediately as opposed to eliminating fossil fuels sometime in the future, we don't know when. That's a huge opportunity cost that you have to consider. Now, the common counter argument to this is that California and Germany needed to spend more money in the technology to make it cheaper for everyone else. But to me, that's a kind of bizarre kind of argument because it implies that immediate greenhouse gas reductions are not important. Hmm. Like they could have, right? Like, I mean, they could have done the same thing for nuclear too. Nuclear is the youngest energy technology. We figured out photovoltaics before uranium. So it's not, it's not, and wind is plenty old as well. So it's not as if nuclear doesn't have innovation potential as well. Uh, they could have just as easily invested in nuclear and made that cheaper for everybody as well. What do you think about the advancements to, oh, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm curious, like your thoughts on the advancement okay. of nuclear power plants, like modular nuclear power plants and, and, and this sort of a thing. Uh, Cause you, I think you make a good case that we should keep on board our current nuclear power plants. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on the, the future advancements that, you know, Bill Gates is investing in and this sort of thing? Well, the current issue with nuclear right now is that it is very difficult to finance. And the reason mm -hmm. is that there's no guarantee that this power plant or reactor that you're building is going to give you a return on your investment. The reason that that's the case right now is that we're struggling with build experience. So earlier you asked me, which country do you think is building nuclear the best? I think my answer to that question would be China because they've shown mm. the most growth in recent history and they also still show the most promise. And one of the things they've accomplished, you've probably heard pretty often that nuclear takes 10 years to build, it's too slow. Last year, let me pull this up because I wrote this down. Last year, So, sorry, not last year, August this year, China started a new reactor, Tian-1-5, for the fifth unit at a, at a power plant called Tian-1. That was started after less than five years of construction. It took 56 months to then really? to construct the whole thing. Wow, that's crazy. And the reason this is possible is that they've had a ton of learning experience with the reactors they've been building. They have a large build-out program, so they're dedicated to this technology, and they've built uh, similar reactors to the one they just built in August uh, in the past. Now, technically, it's only the third of its kind, 
but it goes to show that if you want to innovate in nuclear without just ruining the build time with your first of a kind design, you make iterative development. You don't make radical innovation. That makes sense. Whereas yeah. the, the, the reason the, so the, the median build time for construction uh, for reactors that opened last year or in recent history, I don't remember if it's last year specifically or not, but in recent history, the median construction time is 10 years. So if China is able to build a reactor in less than five years, that means there's someone out there who's not able to build it in more than 15, right? Wow. So yeah. um, because that's how you get a median of, well, I guess it's possible to get a median of 10 otherwise, but that's pretty much what that means. Someone's taking a very long time. And the reactors that take the longest are first of a kind designs, designs that haven't been tested before, uh, designs that there's no learning experience for and no prior documentation, no prior engineering hands-on learning experience. Because the thing is with first of a kind designs, you can make them sound great on paper, but once you start building them, you run into all the unknown unknowns. Like you run into the problems that are associated with questions that you would have never thought to ask. Do you think that uh, modular nuclear reactors are ever going to come online, or do you think it's just a lot of a lot of R and D that that's just going to you know sit in a lab somewhere? Well, there will certainly be a lot of nuclear power plant designs that will forever live in a lab. Uh, as far as modular reactors specifically, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, it, <laughs> it's possible that uh, the U.S. decides to go down this route. Um, again, struggle with the first of a kind design. Maybe it takes a really long time. It goes over budget over time. But the most important thing is you have to dedicate yourself. So if you say, we're going to build a bunch of these, you can start small and, and, and build bigger and bigger with the learned experience that you have and then make yourself, put yourself in a situation that China has put itself into now. Right. So uh, one, one last question is, how optimistic are you about the future of nuclear energy and just in general about the mindset of abundance rather than scarcity? Are you optimistic for the future or are you just just depressed about it? Peter, you're never going to hear me tell, tell you that I'm depressed about the future. I'm always <laughs> optimistic about what's going to happen. And the reason is we don't like human beings don't just sit on their hands when they see a problem coming. You know, and um, so I'm optimistic for nuclear because nuclear has to be the future. And we're going to figure it out. It is, it, it, it's different from me saying that it's going to be the future and it'll just automatically appear. Someone has to move the needle. And so that's, I want to be part of that solution. I'm enthusiastically going to be part of that solution. But I will, I will 100% say that nuclear is going to come back and it's going to be the future. I have no doubt in my mind that uh, pro-nuclear activists will be successful. Governments will find a way to make this technology work. Carbon emissions will be a thing of the past and we will be able to have EP's slogan, which is nature and prosperity for all. Nature and prosperity for all. Okay, hey, well, I love it. Your, your optimism is directly aligned with me. That's, that's exactly my, my starting point, my end point, is that, that sort of optimism, so I love it. Um, well, uh, I would encourage everyone to check out environmentalprogress.org, and I know Michael Schellenberger's book, um, Apocalypse Never, is out now, and you were a fact checker, I believe, for his book, too, right? Yeah, so I... My responsibility was in making sure that chapters eight and nine looked good. Chapter eight is the chapter on nuclear, and chapter nine is the chapter on renewables. And I had to basically make sure that his arguments were sound. These are, uh, you know, true statements, and this argument is something that he would make and would be willing to defend. Awesome. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I still need to pick up a copy of it. So maybe, maybe I'll do that right after this. But I appreciate you having me on, Jimin, and we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to reconnect again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Peter.